what they want to see in my game um, to change and trying to find the balance between still doing what made me great and got me drafted and you know I always had success doing certain things but to try to accommodate to everyone's needs and wants right left no room for my needs and wants in terms of how I could grow my game mm -hmm. and it's hard not to look at these guys that are your age obviously and, and compared so closely through the draft and everything and and wonder what you're doing that wrong that they're doing right or you know what, however you want to paint it um, it's so easy to compare the success of others that are in similar situations to you welcome back everyone to the difference maker podcast i'm your host chris calderoni today actually matt is not here for the first time today in studio actually i think this is our first guest in studio is one someone that i've had the pleasure of working with for the last three two seasons around there right Alan McShane, professional hockey player, ice hockey league, playing for Asiago in the Austrian league, correct? So Alan is going to come in today. We're going to take a bit of a different approach with, um, with Alan. He has an interesting story of basically taking a certain route, thinking he was going somewhere, and then decided, or not decided, but was pushed in, into another side. So he's going to give a little bit of his experience just for any young athletes that are going through it right now. Um, and pretty much, Alan, tell us a little bit of, or tell our viewers a little bit about who you are, why you're playing hockey, and uh, where you currently are now. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for having me. First, uh, first guy here, that's a big <laughs> deal. So, um, Yeah, you hit it on the head. Uh, I guess the point of being here really is to dive into some of the you know, differences that exist in my career so far compared to some other traditional routes that uh, hockey players usually go through. And um, yeah, I've been playing obviously my whole life as as most do when you're getting to the stage of career that I'm in uh, since I was two and a half. Um, went through minor hockey. I'm actually originally from Collingwood, so went through minor hockey in smaller towns, smaller programs, um, made the move at around 10 with my mom only actually to get down to the city. Oh, it was just your mom? It was just my mom, yeah. So my dad got left behind with my siblings. <laughs> and uh, so that was tough. But I think, you know, we kind of weighed the options and figured coming down here would give me a better shot and uh, get into the GTHL, um, you know, get those connections and, and things that come with that. So got into the Toronto Marlboros organization uh, at 10 and just kind of took off from there. It was stayed in the GTHL through to my draft year in the O. Drafted to Erie Otters uh, in 2016, I guess it was. I went 19th to them. And uh, had the had the privilege of playing on a line with Debrinkat and uh, Taylor Radish for a little bit there in my uh, first season in the O. So that was a treat. How was that? Uh, that, was, that was nice. It was fun. Yeah. It was fun to play. I mean, both of them could score at that level. They're they pretty elite and uh, still are, obviously, both in the NHL now and uh continuing to find success but that's uh that was a great start there and then uh, beyond that a couple of years later fast forward one trade later to oshawa and uh drafted to montreal canadians in 2018. Hmm. um so that's kind of the backstory now obviously made the move to europe and that's kind of what we'll be diving into and you know 23 years old now why am i in europe and, and kind of how did i get there the choices that came with it and, and stuff like that but yeah, look forward to Good chatting stuff, about it, man. Well, obviously you're there because of the wine, right? I mean, <laughs> why else play in Italy, right? It, it helps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely definitely not uh, lacking in any of those uh, those sort of treats. So the cheese, we're in Asiago Cheese Town, so it's it's been fun. <laughs> there you go. So one of the cool things. So again, I've been working with Alan for the last, yeah, I guess three years, uh, two three years. This is coming up on the third season, and there were some tough times. Uh, especially going through, uh, you were mentioning before actually we started recording of the pandemic year and going through all of that. Um, a lot of athletes, not just yourself, got to experience that fun time. And uh, how did you get through it? Yeah, it was quite the year. Uh, we you know, had a lot of ups and downs, especially in the OHL. Uh, I was becoming kind of an older guy in the league. And, uh, after, you know, being drafted and that, there are pretty important years following. So 
the, the uncertainty was definitely not easy to navigate. And, you know, we got sent home abruptly. It was like we saw on Twitter kind of COVID-19, what's this? And uh, within three or four days, we were, you know, getting told not to get on a bus to Ottawa to play a game. Um, so within a couple of weeks, I was sitting at home kind of wondering when we were going to start back up. Obviously didn't happen. Uh, ended up having to go into like this eight month full training schedule, like July, you know, mid season form type of training, just in case, in the case that we get called back or if, you know, for whatever reason, hockey starts at some odd time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, it was, it was interesting. We, I luckily had, you know, a great team around me to, to help out at the same time though, it was kind of the beginning of this identity crisis, which we're going to jump into in terms of me losing a lot of the confidence, um, you know, trust that I'd built over the years and not only my, uh, preparation that it takes and, and everything behind the scenes, um, how to act like a top athlete, how to act mm. like a professional athlete because you're just removed from it completely. Mm -hmm. And then also, um, in terms of, as I said, the confidence side of things, you're looking at, um, not getting in that game time and, mm. and you're wondering what's going to happen, you know, what's going to happen to my trajectory, my development. Um, I can only train for so long. So there's a lot of question marks and, um, uh, it got to the point where it was like an all time low and, and that's kind of where you guys came in mm -hmm. and, uh, hopped on a call with Matt and just right away struck me that we were kind of on the same page with how I'd been feeling mm -hmm. and how we're kind of get, getting back on track in the future. We laid out a plan. So that's how that all started. But um, like you said, the crazy thing was I'd been working with you guys for a little bit, a couple months uh, and woke up one morning to a call that I was, there's a chance I could in the next few days get on a flight, go to Slovakia on loan <laughs> in their top league. And I was sitting there and I was like, completely under the impression that the OHL is starting again. They're promising, you know, just wait a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks. I was training ready to start. And, you know, now I'm having to consider overnight, am I going to live in Slovakia for, <laughs> for who knows how long? So that was crazy. I remember we had some interesting chats about that throughout yeah. that process, but it was tough, man, only because we were, and this is, not just for, for that time, but anyone that is feeling uncertain. It, like when you don't know what your next step is, it's tough, right? And it's like, of course, you're going to lose not only a little bit of confidence, but just in your own judgments of, okay, what should I do? Like I, I remember even some of the things that we had to discuss was just different ways of setting new targets for you just to keep it kind of fresh. And yeah, Alan, there's going to be a day you're going to play hockey again. It's going to like all this pandemic stuff is going to end. And it's like uh, when you're going through it, it sucks. And then afterwards, it's like, OK, you know what? It's there. And you were decently prepared for Slovakia when you got there. Yeah. It, well, like I touched on, I, I was doing j like July style training for months on end. Mm -hmm. And which is tough, too, because you've never had to go through something like that, that type of strain on your body for that long, just hoping that you'd be prepared for when the call came. Mm -hmm. So, and then the call coming was a professional style of environment, which is a lot different. You know, I'm expecting to kind of go, if you look at it like a totem pole, I'm expecting to go back into it at the top in the OHL, ready to dominate hopefully and, and take control of the league really. And then the switch flips and here I am kind of going into this completely pro league where everyone's you know, 30, 29 years old, big, strong guys. And now I'm at the bottom of the totem pole. And it's like, well, I have, I don't have a professional game yet. So that was a lot to, you know, wrap my head around and all basically overnight. Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing for us was like, you said, shut it down, you know, just try to take your mind off of it, clear your head, do things that you enjoy for the night and then see how you feel tomorrow sort of thing. And we're keeping that sort of reload system going for a few days just so I could try to be as clear in the head as I could and, yeah. and decide what was going to be best for me. Cause I was still deciding like, do I bank on the OHL coming back? Mm -hmm. But luckily I chose to make the jump and, and get on the plane and go over because the OHL didn't end up starting at all that year. Right. And at least I did get a couple months of games in, in Slovakia. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a learning curve. And, and as I mentioned before, 
identity crisis was the theme. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd been a top player my whole life. I'd been in a position where I never really had to worry about, you know, what was going on on the ice. Uh, right. Especially not off the ice because, mm-hmm. you know, when you're finding success, it's never really something that you have to think about away from the rink either. All of a sudden, Montreal's not signing me. You know, things are are kind of regressing that way. And I'm looking in the mirror and I'm wondering, like, what did I, where did I go wrong? What's going on? Like, right. what made me successful and how to get back to that? Mm-hmm. So that was the theme. And uh, yeah, Slovakia was interesting. We made big strides there, regardless of production in that. I think the, the theme and, and the focus on that was how do I get my systems in check? How can I wake up every morning and make sure that I'm on the right track? Um, I think the the term we were using is like household name. Right. Um, yep. What actions do I need to accomplish every morning, afternoon, night to reload, to make sure that I'm um, in the shoes of a hypothetical household name, yep. whether or not I actually am one. So mm-hmm. that went a long, long way for me to get that down. And uh, it reflected in terms of the little things that were, um, you know, picked out in my game. Teams weren't really liking uh, scouts and that were, uh, pointing out that they want to see improvements on. And I found it really hard f- to try to like flip those things around. Um, kind of the work ethic, uh, that sort of thing. It was never about the skill really. It was about those type of habits. So yeah. I had a hard time re- like figuring out how I can consistently affect change in those areas of my game. I couldn't really find the right formula and just fixing those habits and building them from off the ice and throughout kind of my every day, uh, helped a lot, I think. Yeah. I, I, Honestly, that's why we, so what you were talking about for anyone that, uh, picked up on that, it was the household name. And that's something, that's a tool that we use at Malatium with a lot of you guys is the success identity. And essentially what that is for anyone tuning in, that is the individual, if you can think about it, the future individual that you want to become. And you might not necessarily be there at that moment in time, but what we use it as is as a title for you to work towards. So if we can... Think about it as you have your potential up here. For anyone that's watching, you have your potential up here or where you want to go and you're currently here. Now, where you currently are here is not necessarily like you haven't done anything wrong. It's just where you currently are. And it's like, how do we close that gap, right? So that success at any way you were talking about, we focus on it off the ice so you can start, you know, taking the actions on the ice and make it a little bit easier for you. So we're kind of cutting out all the uncertainty and it's just more of, well, we know what the actions are. And for you is put the puck in the back of the net, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, it really started, I remember I started working with Matt first and uh, the first thing he was like, man, you got to get everything in check. Like <laughs> I, I'll always remember this. It was hilarious because he sent me through this little contract to sign and it was basically saying, you know, we agree to work together and I have to follow, you know, certain things right. um, to make sure, I'm upholding, you know, certain standard to you guys and vice versa. So, mm-hmm. um, I remember he sent it through and it took me a couple of days to get it back, even though I'd already verbally said like, yeah, I'd love to start working with you. <laughs> and he was just on me. Like, he's like, that's an example. There you go. Right away. That can't happen. He's like, you gotta, you gotta dial that in. If you're a professional, that's not happening. He's like, you gotta, we'll, we'll have you waking up at 7am every morning. I want you to text me how you're going to dominate the day. And the specific actions you're going to take to do that go through, you know, all the steps of, um, your morning routine is that's getting a sweat on. That's, um, you know, having your coffee, making sure you do something to kind of grow in terms of like your, uh, your, the mental side of things, diary Mm -hmm. journaling. So that foundation was important for me and it took a long time before I actually realized, um, or saw the results, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, whether or not it was specifically from like those actions of that routine Mm -hmm. or whether it was an accumulation of other things we worked on, but it has gone a long way and I just can notice now when I'm not following those routines, I feel a bit off and it's kind of like, it makes sense. It's all come together. Um, this past year I found a lot of success and in my game and did it ever help off the ice as well? Mm. I thoroughly enjoyed just kind of my lifestyle away from the ring too, because I put in the work for so long that allowed me to kind of get to that spot in my game that I wanted. Right. Back to that identity that 
you know, made me great in the first place. Mm -hmm. And it just like really released a weight off my shoulders to be able to enjoy off the ice too. Yeah. Feel guilty for things and to, to know that my system's in place and, you know, I can deal with that stuff in the mornings and at night and then the rest of the day set up for success. Yeah. Yeah. You had your shit in check. I think actually I remember that that was kind of like an aha moment this year, which was you need to be able to enjoy yourself away from training, away from hockey. Like even if it's with teammates, just to go out, do your own thing without having to worry about all the stuff that's on the ice. And for a lot of people, like uh, Matt and I have discussed this a few times, like you see the Michael Jordans, the Kobe Bryants and all their documentaries, it doesn't show their downtime because it's not sexy to market. Yeah. It's always the hard work and they're not going 100% all the time. Mm-hmm. They need to be able to step back and and step away, right? So that was a big one for Alan. I'm sure it's a big one for anyone listening. You got to be able to take some time off, yeah. no? Even in the season, right? So there's one thing I wanted to ask you about alan which was you were a highly touted prospect drafted by montreal if you don't mind going into that experience how it went down for you because like you said you're a highly talented player coming in um montreal didn't end up signing you and they basically put you through the ringer a little bit yeah so could you if you feel comfortable describing some of that yeah um it's tough. I, I kind of think back to the totem pole thing that I was referring to and you, it, it's not easy on, on athletes, especially growing up with success. Um, in probably most sports, I'd imagine you end up going from the bottom, build your way up to the top, takes years and years of work. And then you end up getting to the top just to turn around and get to that next level where it brings you right back down to the bottom. So I found a lot of success for minor hockey. Uh, it paid off, you know, ended up finding success in the OHL through that. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though I started from the bottom again in, in year one when I was 16 years old, um, you know, that set me up for success to be able to get drafted. And then, you know, you're in this huge machine of an organization like Montreal. And it's so start from scratch. It's back to square one. Right away, eh? you felt like it was just a new level. Yeah, time to dial it in again. I tr- I truly think that in terms of the NHL draft, if you're not top ten pick, you have a lot of work cut out for you, and it just gets, you know, that piles on even more the further down the list you go. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, and you look at it, and it's really confusing because you kind of feel like you're all that after you get drafted, right? And you get all this feedback from everyone, and you're like everyone's telling you you're the best you're the best and that's so great but really you feel like you know well i'm 18 years old i'm going to camp i see all these guys and it's like holy what well, what am i going to do to like affect change and actually like stand out right and these you know people in management especially in an organization like montreal like i mentioned a huge machine your name's on a list and it's like, how are you getting that name highlighted compared to all these other names? And these guys have also found success their whole career. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge, like unraveling thing that you have to navigate. And personally, I considered myself as, you know, had my head on my shoulders for most of my hockey career. And, uh, it was tough to be able to figure out how I'm going to improve enough in such a short amount of time before my two years are up for them to sign me to convince them to sign me basically um you're competing against guys that are in the same position as you Mm -hmm. i was one of like i was the seventh pick from montreal at 97th and there's six guys ahead of you already that they only have maybe one or two spots to 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 sign any players in that draft Mm -hmm. at any given time i think in my case montreal is like pretty much already full like full on their right. on their contract list so it, it's crazy and you have other centers too they were uh, i got drafted as a center like a, a natural centerman and they drafted four or five center that year and uh it, it just it's definitely a lot you have to deal with and so identity crisis i keep coming back to because matt referred to it like that when we started working together he's like who are you like yeah what are you doing? Cause then you're just playing for like, Oh, I'm just trying to get a spot instead mm. of no, hold on. I have my stuff. Yeah. Like they're not, 
Because then it, you you even said it. How am I going to improve in this short amount of time? When it's like, no, they just want to see you yeah. kind of do your thing. But then you get trapped into that yeah. cycle of like, I got to I got to impress. I got to impress. I got to impress. I get, and then you get pulled away from your game. And it's like, yeah. there it goes. Right? That, that was the biggest problem for me is I got pulled so far away from the things that made me successful. Sure, I had flaws in my game. 100% still do. Mm-hmm. Everyone does. But I was so distracted from feedback from people that were in positions of power in Montreal that um, very knowledgeable hockey people, yeah. I'm not discrediting any one of them. I think that they all had their points with what they want to see in my game um, to change and trying to find the balance between still doing what made me great and got me drafted. And, you know, I always had success doing certain things, but to try to accommodate to everyone's needs and wants right left no room for my needs and wants in terms of how I could grow my game. Mm-hmm. Um, and you always hear kind of that saying in terms of when you're working on your skill, never neglect the skills that are your best ones. Right. Um, if you're a good shooter, you want you never want to fall behind in that you want to make sure that you're still the best shooter, keep shooting your thousand pucks, you know, a week or whatever you're, you're doing to make it great. And, I got away from that. I was trying to figure out how can I be like a harder nosed player? How can I um, not shy away from certain battle areas and and keep the work ethic high consistently? And in the OHL, it's pretty high load and you're young and inexperienced. So you're playing all these games and it's like, how can I show up every single shift? Right. And for someone that hasn't developed the consistency to do that Mm -hmm. and haven't learned the tools and tricks of the trade, like um, how to make sure I'm getting that like fight. For me, I'm a, quieter guy so i Mm -hmm. had a harder time finding those like deep-rooted um kind of like triggers is what we refer to them the dark triggers or light triggers right to to like get that animal out of me Mm -hmm. every night we'd play three games in three days on the weekend and how do i bring that in like on the sunday (laughs) so that was the feedback i kept getting like where is that where is that so that was tricky for me to figure out because now I'm just, it's all I'm thinking about and yeah. forget about all that stuff that makes me great. And the thing is like that feedback is good. Mm-hmm. Like you want to be able to get that feedback from whoever it is, whether it be a scout, coach, team that you're trying to get to, whatever. It's important to get it. I think the major part that brings the uncertainty and um, that you need to get clear on is, okay, how can I continue to focus on my game and do my thing while just slowly implementing and focusing on one thing at a time to bring into my game. Cause when you try to do everything at once, it's overwhelming yeah. as, as hell. Mm-hmm. So it's like, how do you just continue to do it and then focus on one thing, implement it. Okay. Let's take a month, really focus on it. Knock that out. Do they have the same feedback? No. Perfect. It's something different. Let's focus on something else. And that's where I think when you were playing in Sweden was where we really had to dial that in mm-hmm. where it was like, okay, this is a completely different country, completely different style of play. How do we, how do we bring out that scorer in you while playing a defensive game? Pretty much, yeah, right. And that's tough because that took, well, that took a while mm-hmm. to to navigate. And it's just getting clear and and really just taking actions on a daily basis. Like one thing, um, actually, a podcast my brother and I shot just before you came in uh, was talking about mindset shifts and you can make a change instantly but you will not see the return or the effects of that until further on down the line Mm. so again you were i think you touched on that just briefly where you're taking all this action taking all this action and it's like the effect comes when and i think that was with the success identity you were talking about before right so it's always interesting to hear your perspective on things alan um before we go i have a couple more questions for you what are what would be some advice that you would give to just someone young trying to make it big? Yeah, I think the the interesting thing about my situation is, and it's partially why we talked about doing this podcast together, was I took this really unorthodox route that I don't know of anyone who's done, like done it before. Mm-hmm. I don't know if many people have really seen someone jumped straight out of junior COVID accelerated. It kind of just changed everything, but, uh, jump straight out of junior and go overseas. Uh, Slovakia gave me the foot in the door to 
to allow that. I think I got scouted a little bit mm -hmm. because of that overseas. And I know some teams like looking at certain leagues and it just so happened that uh, Sweden worked out that way. And I'm proud to, to see the progress I've made. And I think that it's hard to measure the, the progress and the success because usually you look at it like, well, am I in the AHL right now? How close am I to, to getting that call up to, to the NHL? It's always going to be the NHL is the dream for, for hockey players, no matter what level you are, really. It's it's always something that we dream about. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about my situation is I always treat the NHL as the end goal still. Mm -hmm. It is just a different way of getting there, but it's hard to compare. And, and kind of the nice thing about this is I always had an issue before I started working with you guys and even at the beginning of trying to compare my success to others. And that's a pain in the ass. And it's and it's not <laughs> fun. And being, you know, I, I hit every Team Canada, like U18, or I guess Youth Olympics was the first. Right. Um, U17s, U18s, got hurt at the, the Holinka camp. Um, so missed it on that. And then got cut, um, went to the summer camp for the World Juniors, got cut, didn't, uh, didn't make that team. And it's hard not to look at these guys that are your age, obviously, and, and compared so closely through the draft and everything, and and wonder what you're doing that wrong that they're doing right, or you know, what, however you want to paint it. Um, it's so easy to compare the success of others that are in similar situations to you, right? And um, it's just so relieving and refreshing to to remove that from kind of your professional life and away from the rink, like we mentioned, right? When you're when you're getting consumed by that that side of things, it's just it's a bad um, like concoction. It's a bad cocktail because you you end up just con continuing to lose your identity. Like really, it, it all comes back to that. It's like you got to be so confident and sure in yourself, regardless of if you're really doing the right things at that time. Um, in my case, going over to Europe is that going to be the best route for me? Who knows? Mm -hmm. But you have to jump in both feet. You have to just really follow your your actions every day, day in and day, day out, just do your best. And uh, for me, it's paid off in the sense that I feel like I'm accomplishing something every year. I feel like I'm developing something every year and getting closer to the end goal. And regardless of if, you know, I end up getting that call up to the NHL, like mm -hmm. the measure of my success is about um, setting myself up for my future, providing for my family. Um, financial stability and list goes on. We've talked about that a million times is mm -hmm. uh, what's important to me. And um, I'm feeling like a sense of uh, accomplishment for sure yeah. um, on this path I'm on. But uh, I'd say like in terms of advice, it, it's just really carve out your own path. Like everyone has a set of skills that will cater to, to different needs. Different teams will need different types of players and um, you can't really get bogged down trying to compare yourself to others. You just have to have that assurance in yourself and, and you want to bet on yourself always. You're always the most important horse in the race. So um, the biggest tip would be continue on your own path, put, put your blinders on, make sure you know what the end goal is mm -hmm. and try to get as close to it as you can and just follow those actions every day to get there because it, it really is just a, a repetitious uh, cycle where you just got to kind of grow um, as an athlete and as a person. And um, that's the measure of success you should be aiming for. Love it. Love it. Couldn't have said it better myself. For all you young athletes listening right now, take Alan's advice. He's He's been, well, he's been halfway around the world with it. So <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. Um, I appreciate, Alan, you coming in. Again, first guest in yeah. the <laughs> wonderful studio that we have here. Uh, it was fantastic. For any of you looking to watch Allen's games this year. Actually, no, it's impossible to watch. It. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah, they, it's one of the worst streaming they, ones in they, the world. They charge you. Yeah, <laughs> it's pain in the ass. Yeah. So check out his stats, Asiago Hockey. Yeah. Um, he'll be playing. When do you guys start again? I'm um, I'm leaving on August fourth. I fly out. So I think our season's like September fifteenth. September fifteenth. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you guys want some Austrian hockey, Italian hockey, <laughs> you guys can watch there. Other than that. Uh, share subscribe to the podcast uh as much as we love doing this for you guys we always of course would love for you to share it around and other than that take care and we'll see you next week